Thank you all for coming and welcome to the third annual ARPA-E Energy Innovation Summit. Um, my name is Arun Majumdar. As the voice of God just said, and it has been an honor to serve as the first director of ARPA-E. Now this summit is really held for you. We are here to serve you and I'm just delighted to see all of you out here. We really have an exciting agenda with renowned thought leaders and innovators out here. We have 180 ARPA-E projects showcased downstairs and we're also showcasing those teams we could not fund. We want them to succeed as well. We really look forward to interacting with you all through the panel discussions and during the networking sessions. And this year, as you saw, we have introduced a new tweet board. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce the first keynote speaker of this year's summit. To say that he has a deep understanding of the energy landscape would be a gross understatement. As a member of the National Academy's Gathering Storm Committee, he was responsible for a proposal of creating RPE. He was then the director of DOE's Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where he was my boss for the first time. He is now my boss for the second time as the Secretary of Energy, where he's charged with implementing President Obama's all of the above approach to American energy. Please join me in welcoming physicist, molecular biologist, Nobel laureate, the 12th Secretary of Energy, and my good friend, Dr. Stephen Chu. Thank you, Arun. Uh, let's see if I can get this thing started. Oops. It goes backward. So I want to talk to you in my brief moments today about what the Department of Energy and RPE are doing to solve our energy challenge. First, let me begin by saying that science, technology, innovation have profoundly cha changed the world, and I go on for hours, weeks on this, but I just want to show two examples. First, innovation in transportation. And uh, I'm going to talk about a very brief history of the airplane, but the history is going to start a little bit before you generally know it. It starts with Samuel Langley, shown here, uh, the older gentleman on the right with his volunteer pilot. Um, and he received $50,000 from the War Department to develop the first piloted aircraft. He was uh, the leader in uh, gliders, powered, powered gliders. Uh, this is a picture of one of his launch attempts. It was on the Potomac. The idea was it would be launched uh, with the idea that uh, this plane would then take off. Unfortunately, this is what happened. Um, and um, after the second crash in December of 1903, Langley and elderly gentlemen said, I can't take the strain anymore. Uh, the pilots uh, lived, survived, were not injured, but he just abandoned the project. Nine days later, the Wright brothers succeeded. And, uh, wait a minute, members of Congress were outraged. <laughs> um, government can't pick winners. Uh, things of that nature. Uh, now, they made their first powered flight, um, but the military was actually the first customer of the Wright brothers, and here's the military Wright flyer. But even though the, the military was buying the airplanes, the U.S. lost the lead in aviation. And how do I know this? It's because when the United States entered World War I, they were convinced to produce, in American factories, allied design airplanes, not American design airplanes. And we, we agreed. The Allied design airplanes were superior. So what was going on? How do we lead the, lose the lead so fast? Because in the first three or four years, the Wright brothers really ruled the skies. Well, it had to do with, uh, again, government helping. Between 1908 and 1913, the United States ranked 14th in government investment in aviation. So you say, okay, Germany, France, Russia, Great Britain, they were perhaps arming for World War I. We were not. That makes sense. But 
We were also behind Bulgaria, Greece, Japan, Chile, Spain, and Brazil. And so it showed. And so after the war, Congress said, no, we're going to get this back. They placed uh, the Air Act, Kelly Air Act, which said, you're allowed to, uh, private companies are allowed to carry the precious U.S. mail. So it gave them a market. Uh, they had a Commerce Act that provided training and safety standards, again, to uh, build the confidence that airplanes were actually going to be good for commercial standards. So the point here is, we lost the lead. Even though we invented the airplane, the lead was not guaranteed. Lost it very quickly, fought to get it back. I want to tell you another story about um, American innovation. Henry Ford, shown here, didn't invent the internal combustion engine. Uh, he didn't even invent the automobile. He didn't even invent the assembly line. He improved the assembly line. And his idea was that if you could build cars within a moving assembly line that were low cost, high quality, that the multitudes can afford, this is the way to success. And uh, you know, it turns out that Ford was aptly named a uh, company because you could afford these cars. In any case, um, this transition from horse and horse-drawn buggy carriages uh, to automobiles was one of the most rapid uh, in the history of industrialization. If you consider all the infrastructure, the roads, the, 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 the manufacturing stations, the fueling stations that had to go with it. And here, if you took a typical street scene uh, 1890, you see only horse-drawn carriages. Uh, in the next 25 years, it became dominated by automobiles. Why? This technology was superior. But it's also, there was another issue that was driving the switch from horse-drawn carriages and, and horse power to automobiles with horse power, and that is environmental pollution. Now, environmental pollution, 1890, 1900, what was the pollution? Well, it was the horses. Uh, in New York and Brooklyn, there were about 160,000 horses and uh, they produce three to four million pounds of horse manure a day. The horse manure market saturates at that point. <laughs> and, and so there was a pollution issue that hastened the transition to a cleaner, a cleaner form of energy. Now there's other forms of pollution. There's a debate going on about this. Uh, but we feel there's very strong evidence the climate is changing. This is records of uh, four studies, uh, basically the same data sets except the last one, which uh, did a richer dive in the data. And what it shows is that the temperature from 1800 to 2011 seems to be increasing. This is the average temperature over the Earth. Now, if you look at this, we don't understand why there's a plateau, perhaps a dipping, and if you notice, even though there's multiple studies, the oscillations are on top of each other. We don't understand the details of this. Uh, so much has been said about the last 11 years that it appears to be plateauing, and there it is. But over the last 200 years, it seems to be a trend. Okay? But these are fine details about what's going on. We, there's a growing understanding of this. To reinforce the fact that we don't know all the details of everything, I put here the estimated increase in sea level. Um, first, there's the record from 1970 to 1990. Then there were uh, predictions of how the sea level would change. It's just, if you see in this figure, it says best estimate. And those dashed lines are 90% confidence level that the sea will rise somewhere within this estimate. And you see the recent observations say they didn't quite get it right. It's rising faster than anticipated. So again, we don't understand everything. Here's another thing that we don't understand. Um, it's been predicted that there would be more violent uh, storms. These are one day heavy rain and five day in a row, the heaviest rains around the world. Um, in these periods of times. And the upper data where you see color is that you see lots of floods. These are rain events that are torrential rains. Uh, the lower curves, the lower graphs or maps show the computer predictions. Again, we seem to be underestimating what is happening. So again, we don't have it completely right, but it's uh, more and more evidence as we go further. Let me talk about science, innovation, challenges, and opportunities in energy. 
The first thing is, we're all very concerned about the rising price of gasoline. Um, and so this is, uh, for example, the blue curve is the inflation adjusted cost of gasoline from 1976 to the present time, and the red is just the dollars. So you should pay attention to the blue curve. And you see here uh, the rising price of gasoline. It uh, spiked in starting with the oil embargoes in the middle 1970s, get down, had a very stable period, and then has had spikes up. So now the question is, what actually controls this price? Well, is it the production of uh, gas, uh, oil production in the United States? And here you see the same history as it goes, and, and, uh, and in fact, over the last, I think there's a human behind this button. Hello? Yes, it must be. <laughs> anyway, uh, from uh, 2008 to 2011, we see that the oil, U.S. oil production has increased. Uh, and during this sort of steady increase, you see the price wobbling very rapidly. Either the button's no good or yes. Anyway, so what does the price of gasoline correlate to? Well, it correlates very well to the price of oil, which is a world commodity. So here's below is the price of oil and above is the price of gasoline, almost exact correlation. What does that have to do with, well, here's the oil production in the world. You see the OPEC countries with this price and uh, you see that there's a steady gain in price. When the price spiked very, very fast uh, due to an unanticipated demand in oil, OPEC was able to tickle it up a little bit but couldn't take advantage of this high price. Then we went into a deep recession. Uh, and they throttle back a little. Those, that's OPEC production. What about the rest of the world? Well, the rest of the world produces oil at a more or less constant rate. Okay, meanwhile, the price is wobbling. Uh, petroleum consumption and price, you see a uh, steady increase. And until we hit this worldwide recession, uh, there was a, a steady increase in consumption. The suppliers were following it up to a point, and they could not anymore. So what do we do? If oil continues to define the cost of transportation energy, which it does today, will continue to be subject to these unstable and, on the long term, perhaps rising prices. So what should we do? Well, the first thing we should do is become less dependent on oil as a sole source of energy. That means diversify our sources of transportation energy through electrification, through biofuels, through natural gas, other means, and also increase the efficiency. So what is the Department of Energy doing? Well, we're doing a lot of things. I don't expect you to read the fine print here, but what we do is we take discoveries from basic science that we actually try to model and understand the complex combustion inside an internal combustion engine. We develop laser diagnostic tools to actually measure what's going on. We then shift that over from the basic sciences in uh, basic energy sciences in the Office of Science over to the applied areas where we further develop laser diagnostics, this time instead of in a model flame in an actual combusting cylinder. We use that plus high performance computing to then design, help, for example, Cummins engine design a high performance diesel with very low pollution. This was designed in silico. It was designed on a high performance computer. They built the prototype, it worked, and they went immediately into production. So you skip the complete design cycle, or two. Uh, and this is, again, the Department of Energy played a, a crucial role in this. We're also trying to help uh, improve uh, internal combustion engines and lighter weighting. This is a, a picture of the new Chrysler Dodge Dart, Dart um, going to very high tensile strength lightweight steel. The engines are improving. Uh, there's a 1.4 liter turbocharged engine uh, that uh, is rated 160 horsepower uh, and tremendous amount of torque. Um, Ford is developing a one liter three cylinder engine uh, where it will have 118 horsepower. And this engine is so small it fits on the top of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Okay, uh, my uh, second car I've owned three cars in my life. My second car was a two-liter engine, and it had about 80% uh, of this horsepower. Two-liter engines get 250 horsepower these days. Fantastic improvements in engines. Uh, DOE is uh, helping with that. Uh, there's a new company that was one of the winners of America's 
next top energy innovator challenge that was announced yesterday. This is Umquad Energy. They uh, take the fuel, they use a very, they turn some of the fuel into hydrogen that's co-injected with the standard fuel in an internal combustion engine, and they have an inc a great decrease in uh, emissions, 85 to 100 percent decrease. So let's say 85 percent decrease. And so I asked them, how much uh, better uh, power do you get from the same fuel consumption? And they said, well, if you really wanted to know the real answer, you wouldn't believe it. And so, well, what's the answer? It says, well, we've doubled the power for the same fuel consumption. You're right, I don't believe it. <laughs> um, but uh, they said there's a, th a third party validator says at least 40%, but they haven't validated the other improvements they've made. So it may very well be uh, that they have doubled the power. Fantastic improvement. Another um, uh, America's top energy innovator, again, part these are the national laboratories these companies have partnered with. Uh, Pacific Northwest, Vorbeck Materials, using graphene of uh, single layers of graphite to improve batteries. Uh, great progress there. There's another competitor using graphene. This is uh, one of the, I think the Nobel Prize for the discovery of graphene was in the middle 90s. This is now being introduced into commercial products as we speak today. Of amazing uh, rapid deployment into this area. There's going to be great batteries. You're going to hear more about when Arun gives his talk about other batteries. Uh, fantastic development of batteries in the last two or three, four years. If you asked me 10 years ago where I thought batteries would be, I would have underestimated grossly how much improvement they have made just in the last three or four years. Uh, this is um, older work um, in terms of developing batteries that occurred perhaps 10 years ago. Uh, these batteries uh, and its developments are now in the Chevy Volt. Again, it's a partnership with the Department of Energy uh, with uni major universities in the United States uh, and the commercial sector. So this is what the Department of Energy is doing in order to improve uh, the performance, the electrification. We're also working with industry to make lighter weight materials, higher tensile strength steels. This is a collaboration with the Department of Energy, U.S. CAR, uh, and others. Uh, we're also working to build uh, low carbon composites. Uh, carbon composites are used first uh, in high performance airplanes uh, where you have to bake the carbon with the resin epoxy in an autoclave. Uh, there's been new developments. You can now skip the autoclave part. You can, you can heat it up, but you don't need a, essentially a, a large vacuum chamber that's going to greatly reduce the price of carbon fiber wings and fuselages. We have a carbon composite consortium and a carbon composite facility which is built, it's at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, it's built to actually be the test bed for producing new carbon materials to look for inexpensive ways of producing these so it can uh, again go into our manufacturing sector. So those are some of the things, biofuels. That biofuels have great promise, very rapid developments in technology in biofuels. In this particular case, it's um, uh, a U.S. Department-led Department of Energy laboratory in collaboration with a number of companies. Amherst is one of them. You take E. coli or yeast, you feed it first simple sugars to make drop-in diesel replacement fuels, and ultimately just the complex sugars, the biomass, the, the cellulose and hemicellulose to make these complex sugars. So um, I'll skip that. Um, hello, back there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so what is the potential market for clean energies and energy efficiency technologies? Well, it, you know, it's tough to make predictions. Um, and so I will quote uh, the great American philosopher of the 20th century, Yogi Berra, and here he's seen having a philosophical argument. Um, and he said many things. He said it, uh, reputed to have said it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Let me give you an example. Um, when the president of Michigan State Savings Bank uh, was giving advice to Henry Ford's lawyer, and he said, the horse is here to stay, the automobile is only a novelty of fad. Uh, Horace Rackham, the lawyer, ignored the advice of the banker, invested $5,000 and made $15 million in Henry Ford's stock. Uh, but it shows how one can be wrong. Even Scientific American in 1909 said the automobile has practically reached the limit of its development. 
and so on. So as you see, only in the last three or four years, the engines are, are lurching forward two times better than what they used to be, and we expect at least another one and a half times better with lighter weighting materials. Uh, the f most famous quote I could find it was actually um, Wilbur Wright. And it says, I confess that in 1901, I said my, to my brother Orville that man would not fly for 50 years. This demonstration of my impotence as a prophet gave me such a shock that ever since I have distrusted myself and avoided all predictions. Very wise words. So now I'm going to give you a few predictions. <laughs> uh, these aren't predictions. This is Bloomberg New Energy Finance. This is uh, their assessment, first quarter 2012, of what the costs of energy are. Starting the lowest cost is natural gas, but the price of gas is very inexpensive right now. It's just you know, five and, five and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Coal-fired plant is more expensive. Landfill gas is actually cheaper. But I want to point out something. If you look at onshore wind, you look at photovoltaics, they have come down quite a bit. Onshore wind is now less expensive than a new coal-fired power plant. Uh, and its learning curve, its ability to decrease the price, will continue to come down in this next decade. What about photovoltaics? Well, 10 years ago, they were about four times higher price. And so this is what's called a learning curve. That is to say, you make a certain amount of photovoltaics, and you have a certain price. You double the production, the price goes down by a certain percentage. You double it again, it goes down by another percentage. And over on the blue dots, you see the cost of photovoltaics going from something over $20 uh, a watt to, um, well, the 2015 prediction was that it could get down to a dollar watt. That prediction turned out to be not true. It's now below a dollar watt for a solar module uh, in the end of 2011. So the progress has been fantastic. But look at the other curve, that green curve. That's a new technology on a new learning curve. And this is what RP is really all about. Invent a new technology, establish a new learning curve, and let it compete with the other technologies. And so this is uh, CAD Telluride. It is also marching down, and it's now being sold at about 80 cents a watt. So fantastic progress. Um, this is what a solar system, the fully installed solar system utility scale cost in 2004. It was about $8 a watt. By the uh, 2010, it was listed at $3.80 a watt, where you saw it, uh, it was $1.70 for the module itself. Um, that in two years has uh, essentially halved in price. We are looking to develop something that will actually drop this to the whole entire cost of the solar uh, power to a dollar watt, where the module will be about half of it, 50 cents a watt. So we're now halfway there on the module price, about eight years ahead of schedule, and we're working very hard for the so-called balance of systems costs. How do we reduce those costs? When that gets to a dollar watt, solar will be the same cost as natural gas energy without subsidy. So that's our target. Um, a, a little bit, I'm a little bit over time. I'm going to go very quickly through what we're doing in airplane technology. The, we've gone a, a long way, even though they kind of look the same from a 707 to a 787. Uh, the 787 uses only 30% of the fuel of a 707. Uh, a remarkable airplane. We are working with uh, Pratt & Whitney and also GE. These are some computer simulations of GE to better understand the engines, squeeze more power per unit of fuel out. Uh, they've made a 50% improvement in fuel efficiency in the last uh, year since the 707. They think they can get at least another 20, 25% efficiency, again, going forward. Amazing progress. Uh, we think that new materials and manufacturing methods can change the landscape of energy solutions. Many of you may not know that the Washington Monument is capped in aluminum. How can this be, the father of our country, to have, be so cheap as to put a piece of aluminum on top of the Washington Monument? Well, in actual fact, when they made the decision, aluminum uh, cost uh, about a dollar, they actually cost a few dollars an ounce. At the time, gold was $20 an ounce. To put it in perspective, the highest skilled craftsman working on the Washington Monument was paid $2 a day. 
aluminum was a precious metal. There was a new manufacturing method that provided uh, a way of producing aluminum. Today's aluminum price is six cents an ounce, not a couple of dollars. And it turns out that gold, plus or minus ten dollars, happens to be 1776 an ounce. Um, it was a new manufacturing method that transformed the use of aluminum. We are working on new manufacturing methods to transform the use and availability and cost in titanium. Again, another uh, American innovator uh, company that was highlighted developing new methods to eliminate perhaps 80 or more percent of the waste of titanium. So it all goes into the product and not on the, on the factory floor. A big deal. So those are some of the things we're going to be doing. Let me conclude by saying, as we go forward, we really are going to need a second industrial revolution. That is a revolution that gives the developed and the developing world the energy it wants and needs, uh, but can be a clean form of energy. Uh, we're going to get this through discovery, invention, and innovation. And this is going to be very important for our national prosperity as well as our posterity. And uh, to take a famous quote, and this work uh, we, will confer the greatest benefit on mankind. Now, that is a quote from uh, the will of Alfred Nobel as to what to award Nobel Prizes for. But the work that will be done here in the scientific discovery, the engineering, the innovation, ultimately will not only increase the prosperity of America and the world, it will confer the greatest benefit to mankind. Thank you. Thank you.